Yeah, I think uh, we're ready. Um, so, uh, yeah, I welcome uh, once again, uh, Doctor. Can I say your last name? Probably not. Maybe you're like you lose your funding at some point. So I'm just yeah. going to say Doctor B. Yes. Um, I'm yeah. not yet officially a doctor, so yeah. Well, okay. Well, then it's another reason not to. Well, I can use it. Like I said before, I can use it. Just you're not allowed to use it. I can call you a doctor. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, Doctor G, Doctor G, uh, congratulations on uh, Thank you. doing every yes, doing all but the like formal formality of waiting another two weeks. So I don't know how long they take to print it. Um, congratulations on that. And um, Nis, uh, yeah, not a doctor yet. So we only have a first name. I also don't, I'm not a doctor. Uh, yeah. Congratulations um, also from my side. Thank you. Yeah, and um, uh, like like uh, once more, like maybe do you wanna, because I remember like the last few times we talked about this, you were always kind of um, apprehensive about um, the, your, like your final result of your work or like, summing it up because you weren't done you were still working on it mm -hmm. so do you want to like do you want to like give a like bottom line uh on what you found out and what what's your conclusion and what's like the whole picture that you were able to to gather oh well to sum it up in one or two sentences Arno schmidt was obsessed by sexuality that was already known and he well oh, found this obsession through his lens. It's not clear whether it really was the case, but he saw this obsession with sex with sexuality in, for example, Lovecraft, these tentacular monsters, these fishy stanches coming from the ground of the sea and so on and so on. All those uh, things are for Arno Schmidt just thinly veiled genitals. Yeah, I mean, uh, I haven't read. Like, maybe at some point, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna read your your thesis, and I'm gonna like surreptitiously include it in my work. Which, on that note, you're still, uh, you're still, I'm still short uh, your uh, your paper on uh, dark mathematics. I yeah, um, I only have a free yeah. print available, but sure, I can send you that one. Oh, oh, well, they they kept the they kept the. Uh, well, I mean, that's probably the better one. Like, you probably removed all the insanity-inducing stuff. For what's the name <laughs> of that of that publication? What's the name of that publication? Uh, Bartfelder Bote. Exactly. Is that like is that name ironic, or is it a reference to something, or is it really like what it sounds like, like some small town? a uh, local newspaper? Um, a bit of both, I would say, because Arno Schmidt spent the last 15 years of his life in the really small village of Barkfeld. And it's kind of a self-ironic, yeah, pretty ironic reference to this small village. And the very detailed analysis of Schmidt's work Many researchers, especially in this journal, spend a lot of time on finding the source of all, all those quotes, citations Arno Schmidt uses in his work. Thus, the Barkfelder Bote really is this um, analyzing the work Arno Schmidt wrote in Barkfeld. Also, I guess it's a pretty um, scholarly publication. I was going to say scholastic, but that's, yeah, something else. Well, that maybe as well, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, well, um, so, uh, but, but yeah, again, I haven't, I haven't, uh, like to come back to that. I haven't read the, uh, I haven't read your thesis. So, um, mm -hmm. I'm probably like, I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally an ignorant on this topic. And I don't know what your argumentation is, what I think, um, sounds like I'm criticizing your your thesis without even knowing it. But I, I to me, it's like, uh, well, both of these things just happen to be, um, and I might, it's an interesting question why, but I think like both of these things just happen to be um, discussed inducing to a degree. Mm -hmm. And there's like interesting, interesting research from evolutionary psychology of why, like 
why like sexual relations have elements that are disgust inducing and how they get turned off like they get that those mechanisms get switched off um in order for us to have sexual relations because if we had those feelings like all the time then well it would be detrimental to the survival of the species so there's interesting research about that so mm -hmm. but um, yeah i mean i mean like from the internal perspective of of his mind like maybe he is actually referencing um i mean there's a it's a point to be made that Lovecraft isn't not like coincidentally arriving at the same elements of disgust, but really makes sexual, in a way, sexual references. I don't know. I, I just, yeah, I, I have to read it. But it sounds interesting in any case. But it's like, I, I think you've talked about this before. I always have a, like, I have, I, I respect the metaphor for the, like, historical causal analysis that literary theory attempts to make is always mm -hmm. something I uh, have like problematized before, but I respect the, the, the metaphor finding, like the pattern, how do you call that? Like pattern recognition, like pattern identification. Yeah, I, yeah. I guess you could, you could call it that. And uh, of course, uh, this metaphorization <laughs> is um, done by Schmidt. Um, I'm not sure I subscribe to oh. his ideas and thoughts. So I rather spend a lot of time working out these metaphors and analyzing them. But I <laughs> hope I did not spend a lot of time looking for other tentacles in Arno Schmidt's work, etc. Yeah, well, um, so to get to the topic that I think uh, you actually found the, found interesting, um, uh, we should say maybe not totally different one, but um, just to, yeah, let just going going a bit uh, into the into the history of today's episode. Um, so the other day I was just like randomly clicking through uh, my YouTube suggestions. I do not know why, but there ended up, and that's going to go into the links. If I this time remember to actually put links in the description, I ended up on a um, video which I uh, well, it's not a, it's like it's not a piece of music or like an album which has visual content because it's YouTube, so you need visual content. Um, which was called uh, Valachian Cobwebs. Some nights. Some are almost black, Rachel. Like tonight, it seems so dark. I'm scared of being alone. You know you're not alone. I didn't really know where to place, like, place the genre, and it had some, like, movie citations set to it, and I, like, placed down that movie, and it's called, like, Satan's Claw, and it's from 1977. There's a very, like, the visual content is, like, the album cover, and it's, like, a, I guess it's a corpse, like, very, like, pixelated and, and, like, blurry and sepia filtered face of a corpse, with, like, covered by a spider web, like, there's a spider web in the mouth, something like that. Um, I'm not really sure. And I'm like, well, 
Um, that felt like it was appropriately creepy music. Um, and I felt like, well, this doesn't Simon like creepy music because you kept sending me um, like before I asked you like for some music suggestions and things, which I realized are very is like a very different genre. Like you sent me a lot of like I want to say metal, mm-hmm. death metal, dark like, metal. I don't know. Death, I can't really identify it. Like, death metal. I'm not the expert on that. metal, metal, metal theory. But um, I thought like well maybe you like that too. Which um, I did identify that as a dungeon synth. Mm-hmm. But um. That genre, and I am not really familiar with it. But I now that I'm not, like now I know the name, I see a lot of that in my suggestions. And I'm not sure why. Um, it's very yeah, it's like an interesting genre. It has a lot of like '80s, '90s RPG feelings. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, like this one doesn't actually. Um, like the Balakian cobwebs, but a lot of the other stuff has like names like. Um, the Goblin Kingdom or whatever it's like very <laughs> 80s, 90s yeah 80s, 90s Dungeons and Dragons vibe to it but, but anyway um, to continue that uh, story and then I said um, and then I said uh, because we have this WhatsApp group doesn't exist which is like just me venting my thoughts most of the time and then I said uh, well actually like um I was kind of in a creepy mood because I was doing all this like Lovecraft research because I'm writing something about a uh, Lovecraft's conception of faith, which is not really important. Um, and then I said, uh, "Well, actually, like this is a very like the 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 album cover and the name and the music like it's a very um, flavorful combination, and it gives me a certain vibe, which I um, which I described like." Um, gives me a vibe of a medieval cellar where there's like a there's like corpses like the remains of corpses like bones and and skin and hair like dried and mixing with like rotting wood and, and like leaves blown in blown in by the wind and um it's a very uh i don't think like every like not every depiction of like undead or whatever or or spooky things give me the, gives me this like particular vibe and i think like it's it's a very flavorful combination, like, and just this name, like, Valachian Cobwebs, like, it conveys something to me. Like, it gives me a certain, like, mental image. Um, I mean, it doesn't to everybody, but to me, like, and then I thought, like, why do we associate this image? Like, it's, why is it Valachian? What makes this image, like, why does the word Valachian evoke this image in me? And, um, and because I was kind of feeling like, well, I should, like, after just saying, like, how I feel about what this, um, like this combination of words conveys to me and the image and the sounds. I thought like maybe I'm gonna say something smart. Uh, or try to say something like like say something not smart. And I said something which I have been like thinking about for a while, but it's like not really been like on the top of my mind, but it's been an idea I had like like a while ago. It was like um this like the gothic like this the the well, well like Balakia just like sum that up. Balakia is in Romania, I think. I'm not sure all of it is in Romania, but it's a region in Romania, and it, um, I think it's the region where uh, Dracula, like the historical Dracula, um, ruled. Or it's like at least it's like the border area where the historical Dracula, like like Vlad Pepeș, uh, like fought with the Ottomans, and where all these like where he like uh, put the uh, like take the Ottoman soldiers and whatever all these like gruesome stories that were like, circulating about Vlad Pepeș. Uh, since the movie is all of this like took a random place in that region so to just sum that up yeah so all of this like gruesome stuff happened in Wallachia uh, or like in like um, Transylvania, Wallachia, Romania like this region and I was thinking um, isn't it interesting because um, now I, I don't have like the, the years like on the to- off the top of my head I don't have the like publication dates but I think like uh, Frankenstein was published in 1897, um, 1818, I think. Yeah, and Dracula was, was pretty early. And Dracula and was time, published too. in 1897. Yeah, but the mm-hmm. years are interesting for for the reason that um, so I was thinking Dracula, and it's like it's only hi- a hypothesis, right? Because I'd only have like two cases. Um, but I think it's 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 interesting that like. Um, Frankenstein, this happens in Germany, 
So in 1818, if it was that year, you could still write about a crazy scientist in Germany, like reanimating a corpse. Um, like in some lonely castle and there's like this Igor guy and whatever and and then um, but then you go to like 1897 and that become like that's my interpretation it becomes sort of ridiculous because that's like like you have um, like uh, Wilhelm der Zweite like Wilhelm the second ruling in Germany it's like the Wilhelminian era like there's a lot of progress there's industry like everything is modern right and I my interpretation is that it becomes sort of ridiculous to to place a gothic like a gothic tale into that kind of Germany. And um, I think like for a gothic tale to work or to seem right, it has to be somewhere more um, more like a Ruritania, like TV Tropes calls it a Ruritania, um, like some undeveloped place with like superstitious peasants and whatever. And so by the time Dracula gets published, this, and of course, like, it's coincidental that you also have Dracula, right? Like Dracula actually existed in that place. Um, but by the time Dracula rolls around, you have to place him in like Eastern Europe because it's ridiculous to place him in Germany, right? There's like the idea that like, some supernatural count living in a castle in Germany in the Wilhelminian era is like, it's ridiculous. Like the police would come and just arrest him, right? Like you were sucking blood from the peasants, they would just arrest him. Um, uh, now I'm a bit more critical of that take, and maybe we can discuss why, but, um, and then I thought, uh, well, but, like, progress was continuing, like, there's this wave front of progress moving towards the east, and I think, like, Romania had the first electrified, like, electrified subway in, like, uh, like, around that time, like, like, the early 1900s, I think, um, I'm not really sure about that point, but, like, somewhere in Romania had the first, like, electrified, uh, um, like, municipal rail transport and i was thinking like okay so after like if you if this trend would have continued then like eastern europe would have run out like it would have also run its course as a plausible thing for gothic literature and i was thinking well it could have moved further east and mm -hmm. um coincidentally by the time that would have happened so maybe like the early 1900s or like late 1910s you have the russian revolution and that's like a radical progress cult. And this sort of rules out Russia as a possible trope for Gothic literature. Because now, now that's something totally different. You have like a utopian progress cult, right? Like we're not talking about the practical like application of that and what that resulted in, but um, it's just not plausible anymore to as a as a place where you can put like a a vampire like vampire vampire nobility and ignorant peasants and whatever like without without the capability of moving that motive like this this or this trope further east it's sort of bottled up in that area it's bottled up in like eastern europe like the balkans and stuff and i think that's um i think simon found that idea interesting he wanted to talk about that and now the introduction almost took like half the time we have but uh yeah maybe yeah, maybe that's uh, that's the starting point. Yeah, it, it is a pretty interesting starting point. Um, I'm not sure. Did you read uh, John Polidori's The Vampire? Um, uh, yes, long time ago. Yeah, me too, and I'm not sure where the vampire in this story stems from. So I might be mistaken, but I think he actually is some kind of nobility of um, nondescript heritage. I'm really not sure on that. Um, with regards to Stoker's Dracula, I think it's important to note that he referred also to Calmet's Traité sur les apparitions des esprits et sur les vampires, etc., etc., um, treatise on the apparitions of ghosts and vampires and revenants of Hungary. So this whole Eastern European area was from the beginning, uh, an area of vampire stories, vampire myths. And I think that Kaime actually is pretty important for 
this viewpoint you propose, but nonetheless, um, Dracula is full of anti-Slavic cliches, um, actually framing the whole you know, the, the whole of Eastern Europe as some kind of backwards medieval landscape, um, which is interesting to me because this is such a such a uh, it it contradicts the whole futurism of Russia at that time so much, which is really interesting to me. It is as if Stoker, a Victorian, had to write Russia or Eastern Europe back in time. But also with the point you made about this whole mystery land moving even further east is really interesting because when you look at German fantastic literature from the 1900s onwards, there is very often Asian, especially Chinese people with very mysterious roles, for example, in Willy Seidel's um, Das älteste Ding der Welt, the oldest thing of the world, where a mysterious Chinese saves the world from a Lovecraftian entity, or in Leonard Holenia's uh, Ein Traum in Rot, A Dream in Red, three Mongolian lords arrive and actually so solve the whole plot. And I'm not yet sure how long this whole mysterious Chinese trope actually survived in German literature. But I think you are actually onto something with this whole moving even further east. Well, I think that now we're getting like into the broader, like broader topic of um, Orientalism mm -hmm. um, and like exotification of the East. Yeah, I, I how like I, I guess you would prefer to call it like othering if you want, but I think it's a specific kind of othering. Like China, China is still a, a, an other. Like if you want to talk about that, China is still an other. But I think we're talking about a specific kind of othering, mm -hmm. like a kind of othering. And actually, I think like the concept of othering kind of makes sense in this context. For example, you can't really. I mean, you can still other China to certain enlightenment values. But I think um, back then we were talking about a more fundamental othering. It's why I always, and that gets like into a broader topic, but I think like right now all the like opposing civilizations, except maybe like the Islamic world, like if you want to get into this like clash of civilizations, thing, like most of the are like different flavors of Western civilization. Like, I mean, of course, like being China, like Chinese civilization expresses itself in the current system as well. But like it's 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 not as fundamentally different to a modern like it's in, an inter, internal contradiction to modernity. Like mm -hmm. China is not like we're not dealing like with a 5000 year old empire that uses like, I know, venom and magic and whatever. We're dealing with a different kind of modernity there. So um. That's that's just like one thing. And I think like we're, what we are talking about here is a very specific kind of othering, which is like an othering to the values then dominant in Western Europe. I would say like enlightenment and 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 um, uh, rationality, science, which of course like I don't think that's something like you would consider an other in to in those like groups that or like those countries or regions of the world that we now consider an other but i'm not really the expert on that um except maybe like islamic world that would maybe like say oh well they're back like they're backwards and they're like not scientific and they're like just like too religious or whatever but i um i think uh what, what we're talking about here is not just a a like a general difference but like this particular difference and then um i i know like um, like two things I, I, I want to say to that is uh, like one is um, I, I agree with you that probably it's not Stoker himself who takes this kind of like who takes this motive and applies it to Eastern Europe. I don't mm -hmm. think that's an 
a decision, like an artistic decision. One of my points was, um, and maybe that's uh, already an interesting like track in itself. Um, so my mom, I'm not really sure where she went. Like I just was only like listening with one ear or like half half an ear maybe, and she went to some like um, uh, presentation or um, seminar or whatever like uh, vortrag. I don't know how you would translate that, <laughs> which is like I guess it's like a Volkshochschule or something like that, where it was about um, it's like a woman from literary studies something like that, presenting the depiction of China in the media. Mm -hmm. She was going back to, to uh, Fu Manchu, Sachs Römer. Oh. Yeah. And I think, like, I dimly remember there was something before that, like, even, like, Fu Manchu was based on something before that. Might have been Fantomas. I'm not sure if Fantomas was a Chinese, but I'm pretty sure there was something before... Uh, Fu Manchu, which I do not remember, um, and it wasn't mm. a topic like that was apparently like dealt with in that in that presentation. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's that's like the the lineage that's like the lineage of the um, of that like East Asian exoticism, which I don't think is got gothic. Maybe you could make it in a gothic way, but I think um, I've yet to see like a gothic a gothic novel. And I'm not the like world expert on combining, uh, like compiling gothic novels, but I've yet to see like a gothic novel set, like using East Asia, East Asian tropes. I've yet to see mm -hmm. that. Like if it's a gothic novel, it's always going to be um, like Eastern Europe, like crooked, crooked medieval houses, some uh, like castle ruin somewhere. There's probably going to be some. Uh, undead or unsavory scientist or whatever um it's a very specific flair um but uh, but yeah but maybe you could you could write it in a east asian way but i have yet to see that like i think it's a very very specific kind of othering oh mm -hmm. yeah that's that's my other point i'm just going to finish that one real quick um my other point is yeah i, I said like um stoker didn't didn't him I, I think stoker didn't himself like associate these tropes with eastern europe because i know and that's actually the interesting part is um, when Austria acquired uh, Eastern Europe, I'm not really sure about the history, like when that happened. They controlled like large parts of Eastern Europe in the like Middle Ages already. And they had like these like multi-century conflict with the Ottomans. And um, even back then, like the Eastern European provinces were like considered um, places of superstition. And like in a dual way, they were considered places on one hand of superstition, but also places of um, superstition. Being true. Um, so there's a lot of like cases, I know maybe that's like overblown by modern, by the modern media, because people always want to hear about stories like that. But it's a lot of cases of, I don't know, like peasants, peasants somewhere in the Austrian, uh, Austrian part of Eastern Europe, digging up corpses and burning them because they perceived somebody to be a vampire and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And then like somebody going, like some physician from Vienna is going to go there, like bringing enlightenment values to those places and like investigating what's going on there. And, you know, so that's a like, lot of an older trope and has, it's not even a trope. It's, um, it's something that has really been going on. Uh, mm -hmm. this like this difference. And, um, yeah, that's that's like the two points I want to make about that. It's not Stoker himself. I agree with that. But I think I think the area in which you can plausibly tell those tales gets smaller over time. Like um, mm -hmm. you can still tell those tales about Eastern Europe, but you can't maybe tell them about um, Wilhelminian Germany anymore. Um, maybe in a way, you, maybe they resurface as like a Nazi secret Nazi occultism later on. Maybe they re like those same tropes re resurface later on. But you can't plausibly tell like a story of a of a guy like a crazy haired guy in some castle reanimating a corpse. Um, I don't know. That yeah, that's what I would say. Um, not sure about that yet. I am not sure either whether I can offer examples, but. 
I seem to recall there is actually a kind of movement within Gothic literature towards the city, starting, for example, with Poe's The Man of the Crowd. And of course, one could argue whether The Man of the Crowd actually is Gothic. But I think there is a certain brand of Gothic literature that actually can survive within the city, maybe even within the confines of a single home. Um, but I would agree in so far as Leslie Fiedler, Fiedler wrote about Gothic literature in America, in the USA especially, that it's extremely hard to have Gothic literature in a country without past, without ruins, which are essential for Gothic literature, according to Fiedler. And maybe this is also somehow linked to this whole future, I, I don't actually want to call it futurism, this whole movement of renewal of modernizing the whole country, Russia as well as Germany. Maybe the Gothic, the horror actually has to move either into even further away lands or into um, the confines of one's home. I actually can only offer British authors, for example, Barbara Lytton, who used the, the Hollow Earth in his in his coming race and made the home uh, an extremely um, disturbing place in his The Haunted and the Haunters. Well, that's so, one of my favorite stories. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is cool. It is greatly. It is written in a really great way. And I think that this is a way to get the Gothic, the shower, the frisson into the city without having to rely on faraway places. But there's, I think, also some kind of middle way, some middle ground. Um, by placing the mad scientist into some far away secluded place. Maybe the city talks about him. Maybe he gets looked at strangely, but maybe he's wealthy. Maybe he is a nobleman, whatever. He's left alone because he doesn't actually bother anyone. Yeah, of course, sometimes some hobos go missing, but yeah, well, I think that is uh, some kind of middle ground to get the horror also into Wilhelminian Germany. But as you might have noticed, I'm just going on a tangent here and I'm not sure whether that actually is true. Well, I'm thinking there has to be a difference between. Um, sorry, <clears throat> I'm eating. I think there has to be a difference between um, what you could plausibly tell and what um, appeals. Uh, because obviously, authors are not bound by. Um, I mean, they can tell any any tale any tale possible, even sometimes tales impossible. But um, you can find a way in which this would work. It's probably not even, and I mean, that's the key point about tropes is that they are not necessarily accurate descriptions, right? I mean, that has to be the basis of, of this entire conversation about um, moving the like occult East, because obviously none of this can, can really exist. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think, I think, yes, there would be a way for this kind of like a scientist to exist in Germany. And I want to go kind of back, um, I want to like backtrack on on um, my equation of Dracula and Frankenstein, because I think they are fundamentally very different. I, I really want to mm -hmm. backtrack on that. Um, Frankenstein is 
fundamentally a, a story of science. It's like more an internal contradiction within, within like it's more about the horrors of science. It's not about the horrors of antiquity. They're both Gothic stories, but uh, they're both considered Gothic stories and they have like the usual tropes. They have been put into movies at around the same time. That's one aspect. So we associate like some dingy black and white castle with both of them, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like the typical motives, like look, everything looks very medieval and stuff. Um, but I think they're very, they're fundamentally very different tales. Like one of them is a tale about the horrors of antiquity. And one of them is a tale about the horrors of the modern era. And I, I would put like, I would put like, like Frankenstein more in, tra in the tradition of like, like Hoffman or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. actually, what's the name, uh, the guy who steals the eyes, what's the name? I wrote my, my, in school, I wrote my thesis, like my abitur thesis on that guy. Um, I forgot. The, the Sandmann Cop Coppola? Coppola? Yeah, co 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 yeah, the Italian doctor. But yeah, there's Antman, right. Um, and I'm not, like, I, I never really, even though I wrote my thesis about it, right, like, but I was a teenager, right? Like, I got my abitur, no problem. But I can't say I really understood the, the story and what it was about. Um, but I would put it, like, more in that tradition and try to like something totally different. So I kind of want to, like, backtrack on equating them. But my, my, my point is just because you can plausibly tell a story like that even on analysis seems probable, um, I don't think that's um, that it necessarily makes sense to from a from an artistic perspective to tell that story or that it necessarily like the probable is necessarily your inspiration. Now this mm -hmm. goes kind of back to the question like why do people write at all and why do they write what they write? Uh, but I think like even you if you can have this like scientist who's very wealthy and he lives in Germany and reanimates corpses like even in 1920. And then you can go to things like like Metropolis or like like um like all the Fritz Lang movies, pretty much, right? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's possible. It's very possible. Um, you can have oh, you can have it now. You can have like Elon Musk. Well, and I think that's that's uh, like we we say like Elon Musk is it has a secret lab where he's reanimating corpses. I think then we are getting into a different motive. So I'm gonna like kind of like not talk about that because I think you can tell the pretty much the same st story right now, but it would look very different. Like you would have like some multi multi billionaire renting some like owning some island and then he reanimates corpses you could tell that story today it's it's not not like mm -hmm. it's probably a conspiracy out there somewhere um but um yeah i mean you can tell the frankenstein story um plausibly like in the 1950s or whatever but i don't think it's as appealing it's as as appealing as a motive like i don't think there's the same ring to it as if you have like germany as a place that people consider like kind of backwater and there's like superstitious peasants and there's a guy digging up corpses at night on the graveyard to stitch them together. I think um, you can tell that story in the 1950s. You can tell it in the 1980s, and it's possibly possibly true. Like there was there was a, a guy eating eating people, right? Like Cannibale von Rotenburg was mm -hmm. eating people, right? In like yeah. early 2000s, you can, you can tell those stories. They can be true, but I don't think like every possibly true story has the same appeal as a the trope. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I think, to quote H.P. Lovecraft, atmosphere is the deciding factor. Um, if you put Elon Musk into a cyber truck and let him run over people and then eat the sad rest, that's not, of course, that is disturbing, um, but it, I wouldn't call it gothic, while Elon Musk sitting in a dark basement stitching together the parts of the monkeys he had killed last week could be gothic for example lightning cutting the sky and elon musk cackling like a maniac whatever i think that's the uh, po the important point yeah it's an artistic i think gothic is an artistic genre mm -hmm. Very but i also think Whatever the guy, whatever the villain, if you want to call him a villain, whatever he does is in, in Gothic is a solitary passion. And that's, I think, a story that has like, kind of run its course. Um, I, I don't think you could, like, 
you can tell the same story. Maybe like maybe we are just a few years away from a story like that becoming plausible again. But when you look at um there's a, a, a movie series called um I think it's called Rising Dead or something like that. Um it's like five movies or whatever. And it's like the main plot is like there is and this is also kind of a story that's run its course. It's been like the it's it's from the eighties and nineties and you see it less and less now, I think, is um it's movies, right? It's not books. It's like there's an, um, uh, some evil mega corporation, and they have created this like toxin. I don't know what it's originally for. Um, like, I, mean, it's I think they created it to reanimate corpses, and it's for the military and um, whatever. And each, each of these movies is about how this toxin accidentally gets into the environment, and then you have like zombie apocalypse, whatever. Like this and that town is getting destroyed, and there's zombies in that town, and zombies are you know, or like Resident Evil. It's the same tale, right? Like it's a big corporation, like mega corporation doing experiments with uh, some alien parasites, whatever they were explained at the end, I don't know. But um, in that case, I think, I think we've kind of like, and I don't know if that's even still up to date, but it, at least in the 80s and 90s, that was the like big thing. There's no solitary villain, but it's like a faceless mega corporation. And I think those tales are the ones that are more appealing to a modern audience and not like some, um, some single guy. Oh, I want to point out one movie that in my opinion kind of synthesizes those tropes um it's um uh, the alien movies like the later alien movies i think are uh, covenant because it's mm -hmm. um it's uh, like one one uh multi multi-billion trying to uh, like trying to uncover the secret like he's about to die and trying to uncover the secret to eternal life and he like searches for the species that supposedly created humans and that's they pick up a lot of events, like, and they go find those species, and they find like aliens and get mutated and whatever. And um, yeah, so I think that kind of synthesizes those two tropes. But I, uh, yeah, I think like the, the the tale of the like I don't know uh, mid twenties, mid twenties, uh, aspiring young scientist who has like this genius breakthrough idea, and he raids he raids graveyards at night and pieces together the corpses or whatever. Or mixes like the Jekyll and Hyde rule. I think they have run its core. Like it now, it's always going to be a big organization because that's more reflective of what's going on now. I think. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a hallmark of Gothic. It's like the solitary passion. I don't think you could tell. Maybe you could, but I don't think anybody has tried telling a Gothic tale um, about a a corporation. Or like some other faceless organization, like a gothic tale about a military conspiracy involving mm -hmm. Area 51. Could, you know, could, this kind of fusion doesn't you, exist. Um, couldn't you call maybe control a uh, gothic, uh, uh, some uh, in some form gothic uh, atmosphere in a video game uh, with a uh, um, with this mega con uh, mega concern um that is controlling yeah, maybe. Uh, it's completely faceless and you have that weird horror element i don't know if it's really gothic because it's not that dark more clean but hmm, maybe it's, it could be going in that direction the question to me would be just are you dropping the are you dropping the element like, do you have to just drop the artistic element? Because that obviously doesn't work anymore today. Like, mm. if today you're working with, like, Tesla coils and, like, bubbling, like, some bubbling liquid in a bottle, and you have, like, these Leiden flasks and buns and burners and whatever, like, you're probably, like, that's probably a big step. Like, it's making you very, very inefficient. That's going to make you very inefficient. So maybe, like, maybe something like that is just not, like, this artistic element that's, like, char characteristic of Gothic, maybe you have to strip that away. Um, necessarily, but I think I think like because they're just like anachronistic, like you can't tell like in the time where this kind of thing um or like these kind of stories happen, you don't have like Tesla or Amazon, you don't have these like mega corporations. Even though I think like um, Once Upon a Time in the West, it's a western. I'm sure Simon knows it. It's one of my favorite movies. Um, I think it kind of goes in that direction, but um. <laughs> I think, yeah, kind of like I'm not going to argue the point because another tangent, but um, 
And I think like maybe you just have to take like if you want to tell a story like that in the modern era, you have to strip away a lot of the artistic stuff that characterizes at least the visuals we've come to associate with Gothic, um, maybe. Um, but maybe you could tell a, a story like that. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Maybe it's just like really the artistic. And the question is like if you strip away the artistic, is it still Gothic? I guess that's a matter of definition. Um, I mean, you can define it either way, I guess. Yeah, I think most of what we are doing or talking about is actually a matter of definition, isn't it? Oh, that seems like a closing statement, Simon. Um, <laughs> yes. Well, it, it very well could be because I at least do have to go very soon. But that does not oh. have to stop you two from continuing. Yes, it will. It always does, Simon. Without you, we can't go on. Oh man, oh man. I'm really oh, sorry. What should we do without you? What should we do without you? But maybe we'll meet again in like two weeks. Yeah, definitely. All right. See you guys. All right. Bye. See you. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. You too. Bye. bye.